What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. Now, on today's episode, we've got on Pat Stedman, and he is a professional dating and relationship coach. So welcome to the show, man. It's good to be here, Zuby. Thanks for having me on. That's an absolute pleasure. So how did you get into the world of dating and relationship coaching? Because that's a, that's a, that's a very um, unique very unique profession right there. So tell us your story. Yeah. So just in brief, um, I mean, about a decade ago, I didn't know what I was doing with women. I just got out of a serious relationship. Mm -hmm. Uh, thought that was pretty much the end for me. Didn't think I'd ever end up with a girl like that, a girl, like an attractive girl again. And then Mm -hmm. I fell into the game. Like a lot of other people got into a lot of pickup stuff and then gradually that got more nuanced over time. So I started to borrow from people who were talking a lot more about authenticity and then even like playing around with like hippie spirituality stuff and then coming back into the manosphere, a lot of the red pill things. So I'm, I'm really a synthesizer by nature and I try to get really deep into what's between dynamics. And so a lot of the work I do with clients as a result is, is very deep, um, really deals with beliefs and whatnot. Okay. So, so yeah, I've been doing it since 2015 and it's been great. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about your, your life before all this. I mean, what was it that, um, I like to, I like to, what, whatever someone is doing now, I like to sort of hit rewind and go back and see what were the sort of key points in, in their life or in their overall journey that sort of led to them doing, doing what they're doing now. So tell us a little bit more about your background and your story. Yeah. So I was really in training to be something with like international relations law uh that's what i did in in university and then when i got out of that i was about to go to law school i was working at an investigations company i was a private investigator actually Mm -hmm. so i had like even dabbled around i mean i when i was in college there was even like you know this is upenn there's like cia recruitment stuff and so i was always very much like investigating and trying to understand what's what's going on behind the surface but the the dating stuff was just on my own time Mm -hmm. and i was in a little form and i was helping people with that and i'd gone through the process of getting to law school got in but then i declined to go because of the the cost it just kind of hit me it was like once my ego was out of it i realized this wasn't actually what i what i wanted to do and so i took a big promotion at work and just kept doing more of this dating stuff on my own and then Eventually, when it was time to, to leave that, because I didn't want to stay in the corporate world, mm-hmm. a lot of the guys who were in this forum that I'd been helping, they asked me, I mean, they basically said that I should go into it professionally as a coach. Because mm-hmm. it was like a forum that was based around another dating coach, Nick Sparks. Mm-hmm. And I was, it was at the point where I was basically doing more of the teaching than he was in this forum, in the forum. Yeah. So uh, that's, so I, I jumped in. And then to be honest, the first like, two years, two, three years were pretty rough. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, when you get involved with um, a new business and there's mindset stuff that isn't quite there, yeah, that was sabotaging me big time. And I had to figure out my voice and it wasn't until around 2017 that that happened. And then things started to really take off. I got you. So, you know, you said you started out to be honest, like, like most men do, um, you know, a little bit, a little bit clueless in, in, in your own words. Mm -hmm. how did you go from that to being in a position where you are actually able to coach other people, especially on something that is as, I don't know, I don't know, I don't even know the right word, you know, like dating and relationship coaching to me, to me personally is not like a weird thing at all. Mm -hmm. I think that makes total sense. I think people should probably, relationships are an extremely important part of people's lives. So it's weird how people have this a lot of people have this sort of like thing in their head that oh you know nobody should need relationship coaching or nobody should need dating coaching but then you kind of look out there at what's actually going on in the real world and you look at like the success of relationships and marriages and you know what's going on with men and what's going on with women and it's like well clearly people need some guidance here yeah yeah so um so what's been your own personal journey from going from being, you know, clueless or just not really knowing what's going on to being able to do what you do now? Well, it it is funny you say that. I mean, people are, I think the only way that people even have a baseline to understand what I do is because of Hitch. Okay, Um, yeah. 
<laughs> so that gives them <laughs> some idea that they're, oh yeah, it's like your hitch. It's like, okay. yeah. Um, it's interesting because when I went down this path a decade ago, I mean, it was still relatively niche, very tiny. A lot of the the stuff that's now, some of which has like really permeated even the quasi mainstream thought. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very tiny community at that point. And I thought that the, I was some kind of like, you know, weirdo that like I, I had like a problem that I like, I struggled with him and other people didn't. Gotcha. And so going through that process though was, has been a really big gift for multiple levels because first off, I got to experience what it was like going from the very bottom, like having a hard time, even just creating basic attraction. Mm -hmm. And to be, to be fair, a lot of this was actually in my head. Like I wasn't as bad. I don't think as I thought I was, mm -hmm. I mean, my first girlfriend was, was a very attractive girl. So obviously it wasn't, but I had low self-worth and I did not understand how women worked. Gotcha. And so as far as I was concerned, everything was like, if it was impossible, anything I could get, I could only get when like, and have control over it. So starting to understand that understanding social dynamics, understanding sexual dynamics, uh, gradually it's like, it made more sense. I got more confidence in that realm. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing is that, I mean, it's not cool, but from a business perspective, it's been good because of all the, the BS going on culturally and with society. And I know you know all about that. Mm -hmm. uh, like there's actually an enormous demand for it now. Okay. Um, people, a lot of people still have a hard time trying to get over that, the, like the conceptual block that they need help with it. But as mm -hmm. you noted, I mean, it's one of those things that there's only a subset of the population at the moment that is open to doing it. Sure. Um, but there's an enormous number of people who actually need it. There's an enormous amount of people who are struggling. Mm. So so yeah, it's been good. And, and just coming from the bottom up, because I think that guys who are naturals, mm -hmm. for instance, obviously it's great for them when it comes to, to meeting women and it comes to, to dating, et cetera, but they don't actually understand where someone's head is in an yeah. earlier part, point in it. Yeah. And it's the same thing for me with like my marriage, right? So I have the benefit of, of having gone from like the bottom of dating to like being able, you know, dating multiple attractive women at the same time, no problem. Mm -hmm. And then with my relationship, you know, we like, we got serious and I started a business and like, and it wasn't doing well. And, and like the relationship started to go down to like kill zone area. Mm -hmm. And so I also understand, and now it's like amazing, but like I, I went down to that loop too. So it's also been really beneficial now for guys who are in relationships. I'm not like, talking from this you know this position like i haven't been there yeah, yeah so so what was your own learning process man i mean i know you're uh you're you're, you're a married man so you know you don't need to go into anything that's uh, <laughs> gonna potentially get anyone in trouble but i mean what did you you know what was your what was your own personal journey in in that sense you know when it was like okay i wanna you said you were contributing to this forum did you join it initially i guess you, i'd imagine you probably joined it initially more to like learn and get tips and then maybe over time you reached a position where you were able to actually help other people how did that i'm trying to just get get my head yeah. around how that how that happened so i actually worked with him i worked okay. with nick so everybody who was in that for, in that forum it was really a facebook group okay everybody who was in it were people who had worked under nick and and that was like a boot camp what you would call it where okay. you know he'd take you out for a long weekend and you'd go and approach girls and you'd mm -hmm. learn how to escalate situation. Um, it was amazing. I mean, I, I learned so much from it. A lot of things crystallized over that period. And I, I think that, so my, my journey was, well, the first thing for me, and this is what I credit that book, the game, even though it's, it's, I would not recommend it as like a tactical guide. Yeah. Um, although it's amazing writing. I mean, Neil Strauss is a really good writer, mm -hmm. but it gave me this idea that who I was, I could change. And prior to that, it's like hard to believe now, but at that time, like I thought that I didn't have any agency over any of those things. Yeah. So that shift was important. And then it was, it was going out in college, trying to expand a social circle, trying to meet girls, trying to, you know, sleep with girls pretty much. Um, 
And it was just practice, just yeah. practice, practice, and paying attention, trying to understand. And then gradually, I started to like, it, I was, after I accumulated enough tips or whatever and tactical advice, start mm. to think deeper about it. Well, what's actually going on under the hood? And, and that's really been the trajectory. Like, I always try to figure things out. I'm very, I'm very inquisitive. Yeah. So it was, it was, it was almost like a, I don't want to, almost a somewhat, somewhat scientific approach, right? Like a, an analytical mm-hmm. kind of like, okay, this is, I'm going to try this and this is the result. I'm going to try that. And that is the result. Um, is that, was it, was that kind of how the process was? A huge amount of that. Okay. But, but I will say this because there are people who are, who are super, super analytic and they're looking for like systems and stuff. Yeah. One of the, uh, I try to understand it, but mm-hmm. the biggest thing is emotion and vibe. Mm-hmm. it's the most important thing. And so guys who get too analytical about it, they sort of miss, like you need to feel your way through situations. So what mm-hmm. I like to do is feel my way through a situation and then afterwards try to put together what was happening, but you don't want to be in your head. You don't want to yeah. be following a program. I mean, some people it's maybe useful training wheels, mm-hmm. but I don't think it's a good habit to get into because then you get used to being rehearsed. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's also becomes, I don't know. I think it's weird because it can become too cold and clinical, right? Especially because you're, you're talking, we're not, we're not talking about dealing with, dealing with widgets or, you know, putting together like coding or something, right? Okay. <laughs> you're, you're talking about like human, human interactions, right? So this doesn't even have to be specifically between men and women or anything romantic, but if you're just dealing with people and having a conversation with people, like it would be really awkward if I were like, going through some sort of checklist on this podcast right now of like, okay, I need to say this and then ask that. And if he responds this, uh, and I've got some decision tree and it's like, it's like, mm, you know, if you're doing that in any human interaction, then you're you, at that stage, you've kind of lost the point. You've kind of lost the plot again. Right. Well, you know, Zuby, it's, it's a really common thing yeah. in the, in the dating world, unfortunately. And I get it to an extent for some guys because they are a lot of them actually legitimately come from computer like encoding backgrounds. So mm. for them, this is that's sort of like their their stepping stone. Some okay. of them get stuck there though, and they actually look at it like a game. And their whole objective in life is accumulating notches. And it's yeah, yeah. personally, I think, pretty sad. Mm. Um, I understand. I understand. Like I'm, my philosophy towards this stuff is very much about. Like, okay, I understand where you're at and what you may need to do to get where you're at. But I always try to get guys to the end goal, even if they have to, they may have to move through a couple of steps, Sure. but the objective is for them to be able to actually have a stronger connection with a human being and something that's real and meaningful rather than, than fake. Yeah. Uh, So, so what kind of, what kind of guys come to you and what sort of issues or problems are sort of the most most common what do you normally see or hear there's a couple of different subsets i mean there's some guys who they they can get girls right it's not but there's there's deeper stuff that they're missing especially when it comes to themselves there may be Mm -hmm. one or two like things that's stopping them from getting like a really quality girl a girl who they want to spend more time with Mm -hmm. um you know commit to long term other guys sort of more of a standard story where they've struggled, struggled pretty much to get girls at all. Maybe they've had a couple, but it's been mostly a a difficult journey for them. So for them, a lot of it is going into the deep work Mm -hmm. and dealing with a lot of the beliefs around that and then getting them out and, and getting them just practicing. And what happens is as they take action, we take those experiences and then I help them to understand not only what happened in that experience, but also what is the theme there. So the whole idea is, you know, I have almost, I mean, I would say like at least nine out of 10 clients Mm -hmm. I'm done with within three to six months of working with them. And then at that point, it's not to say that like their entire life is completely different, Mm -hmm. but, um, or or what I, what I mean to say about is that they don't need any help. Like they don't, they've, they're getting like every girl that they ever want. It's not like that, but they have all the tools to go yes. out there and to continue to learn. Yeah. And then I have guys who are in relationships and the sort of two subsets of that are guys who, and this is a, a more common one, unfortunately, guys whose relationships has really like deteriorated quite mm-hmm. substantially. And a lot of them are really on the verge of divorce. Okay. And 
I would say now my objective for those guys is okay. We're not like, this isn't about saving your marriage and that may seem counterintuitive, but Mm -hmm. it takes two people to save a marriage. Sure. So you can't control what she's going to do, but Mm -hmm. what you can do is you can control what you're going to do. And we're going to get you in a situation where you're maximizing your potential of, of bringing her behavior in the right direction. Mm -hmm. But if she doesn't go that way, you're going to come out of it in a phenomenal position to get into something great in the future. Yeah. And if guys come in to try to work with me and they don't have this, they're, they're not like, like they're not committed to themselves. If they're Mm -hmm. still oriented towards like, I have to do everything I possibly can to save this relationship. It's like, it's not going to work. Yeah. 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 And how did you, um, I mean, I, I do, I do coaching myself, right? I, I do life coaching. I also do uh, some fitness coaching and stuff. And one thing that's, I think every, every coach deals with, especially when you're, you know, working one-to-one with people like this is, uh, you know, a sense of, a sense of imposter syndrome, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes, you know, I've, I do, I've done life coaching and sometimes I'll be working with someone and it's like, you know, they're very successful in their, in their own regard, you know, certainly at least in, in certain areas or whatever. And sometimes I'm kind of in my own head, you know, I, I can, I can do my job. I, I can do the job and I can do it well. And, you know, they value it and I'm helping them and everything. But sometimes there's this thing in the back of my head, like, am I, am I like qualified to be, yeah. <laughs> you know, especially if it's like someone who's like, you know, a decade older than me and I'm, you know, they, they've been through things and are in situations that I'm not, I haven't even experienced. And I'm here like saying, okay, you know, I think this, or I think that, or, you know, maybe with yourself, right. If you're dealing with someone who's been um, you know, married for like a, a long period and, you know, they've been through this and that, and maybe they're a bit mm-hmm. old, then how do you, um, how, how do you, how do you deal with that yourself just in terms of having that sort of confidence of not being like, do I, am I out of my depth here? Do you know, am I, am I the right person to be, to be doing this? Um, even though, you know, you very well may be, but there's always that sort of, sort of thing in your head that just sort of niggles at you. Yeah. So there's, there's two parts of that, I would say. So one of it is that someone in that case who's going to come to me and it's kind of, and that thought might cross my mind, like, well, like, can I really help this person? Mm. But they're actually, they're usually people who from an objective standpoint, you wouldn't even think maybe needed that much help. Yeah. Right. But the, the thing, and I, it's the same, I, I live this myself. The high performers always have coaches. That's true. Because it's always about like, okay, yeah, things are, are here, but I want them to go here. Mm. How do I make things even better? And so one of the things I have to remember for myself is that, okay, this isn't for, you know, it's very, it's like very rewarding when you're with a guy who's sort of dating your life is in shambles and you can help them put these pieces together. And it's just like, Oh my God, like everything's changed now. You know, it's, yeah, yeah. that's an amazing feeling with these other guys. You're dealing with much more subtle things mm. and you have to understand that their expectations are actually not even about something going crazy like they're paying for the that like extra insight or two even if they're just like minor tweaks it's like i missed that okay yeah yeah, yeah. that's it and they do a lot of the i mean they're smart they do a lot of the work for you but you give them objectivity and you give them a place for them to to bounce ideas and their experience off of and they are the people who are often i mean they're among the the most happy about the experience i'm sure you're used to this too Yeah, yeah yeah so a lot of it also is just you just have to change your your own expectation for it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, it's it's one of those interesting things. I mean, I I haven't worked in the corporate world for for a long time now, but when I used to, that I, I was a management consultant for a while, and that was one of the challenge, challenges for me, right? Because I'd come out of university, it's like I'm 21, 22 years old, and I'm being dropped into like these big blue chip companies, and I'm supposed to be giving them advice or you know con- <laughs> consulting them on their business. You know, I'm there like. 22 years old, I'm there like talking to someone who's 55 working mm-hmm. at JP Morgan, you know, trying to <laughs> give them, give them advice on their business and stuff. I'm like, I'm, I'm, and again, on, on one hand, I'm like, okay, I'm doing my job and I'm doing well. But on the other hand, like what on earth, like makes me think I, <laughs> I know, me man. Think I'm qualified to be doing this. <laughs> so it's, uh, I guess it's something that's, that's always going to be there in a, in a whole lot of different situations. Um, so in terms of, uh, what are some of the what what are some of the main issues 
or the main problems? Well, firstly, actually, I have a question. Do you do you work just with men, or do you work yes, with men? Yes, I just okay. work with men. Yeah. Okay, so in terms of maybe maybe you can still be, might still be able to do both sides though. But like in terms of the the problems that guys have in this regard, or you know maybe some of their their misconceptions or things that they're just kind of doing wrong when it comes to women and relationships and things like that. What are sort of the most common errors or mistaken beliefs or things that you come across or just observe generally? Yeah. Well, one of the more common ones, and I'm sure you've, you've heard this before is the, is the nice guy syndrome. Mm. Um, it, I think on a macro level, what you see today in society, it's a real problem is the depolarization of men and women. Okay. So, uh, women have been trying to become more masculine because that's what culture has been telling them to do. Mm-hmm. And men have become more feminine because mm-hmm. um, that's what, what culture has been telling them to do. And the results have been abysmal. I mean, it's been just absolutely terrible for attraction for both parties. Um, so getting guys out of that position where they're, where they're wimps and they're really trying to cater to a woman's emotions mm. I think that that's a really important thing is it's in themselves uh, in a non-reactive way to women. Like she can do, she can react however she wants to react, mm-hmm. but he's still going to go off and he's still going to do his own thing. Now, of course, there's more nuance to that on, on certain levels. It doesn't mean that you just become inconsiderate. Sure. I am, uh, I'm very, very opposed to the gender war in general. Okay. And I, th- and I think that it's, I mean, it's just disastrous. So I, I'm also opposed to guys viewing women as the adversary, but mm-hmm. there's a difference between understanding that women are different and they respond to different things versus viewing them as someone who's like out to get you and trying yeah, yeah. to, because then you just become actually, you just precipitate the problem. Yeah, sure. And, that, and there's a lot of that on both sides at the moment. You know, it's uh, people know I'm, I'm critical, very critical of modern day what people call feminism you know modern day feminism um because i think it just contributes to this whole you know selling young women certain messages and telling them that you know whether it's men are out to get you or you know there's this thing called uh, rape culture that mm-hmm. you know lots of men are complicit with or you know you're paid unfairly and there's the patriarchy and you know all all men are we're secretly plotting against women of how we can, you know, put the boot down on them and all of these sort of ideas, you know, whether a man is, if a man is nice to you, he's being benevolently sexist. If he's mean to you, he's just being outright sexist. It's like, no matter, no matter what they do, it's like they filter something through a lens that makes mm-hmm. men just go evil. And I think that, you know, sorry, be evil. And there's a, there, there, there can also be a reactionary movement on the other side, right? Which you do see with certain types of men and certain online communities and things where mm-hmm. they're sort of just the inverse of that, where it's like, okay, no matter what, it's women are just like this or all women are like that or, you know. Yeah, hypergamy, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it can, yeah. you know, like there can be elements. I think, I think the reason these appeal to people, well, one, first, because I think people are angry and people, um, people like communities and people have certain anecdotal things they've seen or certain experiences, which they then like to use to paint large swathes of people or just the world or whatever with very broad strokes. Um, And yeah, I think, and I think it also appeals to people because there in, in most ideas and ideologies and belief systems, there's at least a kernel of truth. Mm -hmm. Even, Mm -hmm. even like, Mo, even like most ex, even like extreme ideologies and things right there's normally like a kernel of truth in them right they're, they're, they've got something right you know that 10 percent is correct but then mm-hmm. they use that 10 percent to like paint like a crazy other 90 percent. you see what i mean and it's like that is that seems to appeal to a certain a certain type of person i don't know well i think that people it's guys in particular who have been really damaged and really hurt and so they're in this trauma, trauma, traumatized position. And when someone basically tells them, yeah, you've been a victim. Yes. And, you know, it's not your fault. You were lied to. Like, it's, I mean, I understand and, and to an extent in the very beginning, some degree of pacing, like, hey, it's okay. Like you were lied to, mm. but they have to leave the victim role, especially if they have any hopes of actually being good with women yes of course 
uh, it, everything is about taking agency. And I think that, you know, you have these, there is a subset of women that are extremely brainwashed and, you know, seeing a lot of the things that you, you were mentioning about, yeah. you know, guys are sexist no matter what they do. No matter what, yeah. A lot of the work I do is to help guys use discernment to screen women out, qualify women better. Okay. Because there are a lot of women who, what they really just need is they need a guy who's strong and confident in himself and women will shift their perceptions accordingly. Sure. I mean, frankly, we only need 20% of men to be like really, really strong and fighting against this and setting a standard for how mm-hmm. men should behave mm-hmm. for the entire facade to collapse. That's true. Because, I mean, society follows these passionate minorities and, and women follow those men. That's true. So it's really about, I, I don't want, I'm not trying to save all of them. Because yeah. a lot of guys, I, I mean, a lot of them are just, they're going to play this victim role. Or they're they're going to pr- prefer to be brainwashed. And mm-hmm. there's no, no, no nuance that you can go in this third position where it's like, yeah, we don't have to hate women, but stop taking what they say so seriously. Yeah. Yeah. People, people struggle with balance in general, don't they? A lot of people think everything's binary, right? It's either that way. It's either all the way there or mm-hmm. it's all the way there. Either it's, you know, women are perfect and angels and men are the complete problem. And I'm going to stand here and I'm going to self flagellate and I'm going to complain about men and I'll put feminine male feminist in my Twitter bio and, you know, I'll lament how evil men are or like some other extreme where it's just like, yeah, you know, women are just this and it's just that, and you know, yeah. just, you know, and it's like, Come on, guys. You know, we we kind of need each other here as a as a species. As, you know, so can we at least uh, can we get on? I, here's here's a question. I mean, where where and when do you think this really started to change, and what do you think were the main factors? Because one one observation um, is that a lot of these, I mean, not not all of it, but a lot of what we're talking about is somewhat unique to the Western mm-hmm. world. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a lot of it is also unique to just modern times. I think if you were to go back to just, you know, our parents' generation, then the whole dynamic was just, was just very different. So mm-hmm. what do you think, you know, I have my own ideas, but I'm curious to know what you think is the, is the cause for that. Well, I think that there are two aspects to it. So the first was that you had in, um, after World War II, mm-hmm. I mean, World War II, it, was an extraordinarily traumatic experience for the Western world. I don't think that people even at this time period quite comprehend, you know, how serious it was, especially in Europe. And so you had, after the war, you had a lot of men who were coming home and, you know, we, we really do idolize the, the greatest, you know, the greatest generation, so to speak. And I don't, I'm not saying any of this to be like dismissive of, of everything that they did, but the reality is like men came back from that and, and they were traumatized, yeah. right? And so you had this, they were, they had a very, and, and that combined with jobs that were taking them away from their family, it was you had this sort of sole breadwinner experience where they were off at jobs all day long and they came back and a lot of tension and I think trauma inside of them. And so they were not, let's just say the most affectionate um, parents generally. It's not to say that they were bad parents, but there was a distance. Mm-hmm. And I think that their children, I mean, we like to make fun of boomers, but um, it's important to understand also where they were coming from in their context. They could have, you know, they, they did go too far yeah. in many ways, but there is, I think, an understandable backlash in that context to, especially with, you know, you have like Vietnam and you have this constant threat of nuclear war, that there is a sense that maybe like mas- this masculinity was toxic. Mm-hmm the way that things were. Maybe there yeah. was something about it that wasn't quite right. And I think that there's also ideological subversion that played on this. I mean, a lot of the narratives around feminism, you know, were not, uh, they didn't just come out of the either, right? No. They had been working there for a while. And you can look at the economics, right? The fact that when we did have women, they brought, tried to bring women into the corporate workforce. Uh, basically, within 20 years, you had people making the same amount for t- as, you know, two people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So th- there was definitely other things going on that preyed on this feeling, mm-hmm. but I think that was the feeling there. And it was a sense that, you know, as a guy, like men, 
maybe need to allow more emotion to, to flow through them without being like a, like a bitch or anything, but being able to have, <laughs> yeah. you know, there's a difference between like being a bitch and being repressed. Yes. Right. Like mm-hmm. there's a, there is this third position where you can be able to process emotions and feel them and mm-hmm. without being feminine. Yes. So I think that that's where some some of it came in and then you had all the economics things. But you know, what's interesting also is I think that you notice that feminism is most strong in sort of Anglo countries yes, for the most part. And I've been thinking about this because communism actually had feminism. Mm-hmm. And you have the women in, in the Eastern Bloc, they are extraordinarily educated, right? Mm-hmm. They worked during communist period. Mm-hmm. And yet they have not lost their femininity. That's true. And I think for them, they understand that, you know, like we've been able to do all the things that guys do and we don't, as a result, value it that much. Mm. They but, understand that what works on guys is femininity and, and they want to feel like a woman. And, you know, so they'll get their PhD in era and, you know, astrophysics yeah, yeah. and yeah. still go out and, and wear high heels and want the guy to, you know, open the door and stuff like that. I mean, Slavic women are, my, my wife's Polish, Slavic women, you know, they're, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't think that you should like, there's a lot of fun <laughs> stuff yeah, yeah. about Slavic <laughs> guys who have dated Slavic women, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but I think that if you contrast them with Anglo American women, especially American women who have been, I mean, they were frankly pampered mm. to a large degree, especially after the war. And so you had this, and I think it was the same in sort of upper, upper middle class, which is also where the feminist ideas came from. Yeah. So you have women who actually were completely pampered and they didn't do anything. And so since they had no agency, this ideology that, well, yeah, we actually don't do shit because men didn't let us. That's the reason why. Mm-hmm. And so that's one of the reasons why there's so much hysterics over here. It actually comes from, I think deep down a sense that, and maybe this is changing, but a sense that they were actually not able to do things. Mm -hmm. And so they were projecting it outward on men. So, you know, men maybe have a little bit to blame because we, we pampered them too much. And by the way, I don't, I don't think that that's like a good strategy. I know that there's, there's some in, you know, manosphere circles, there's some pushback, I think, that tries to go to the 1950s again. Yes. And I think it's important that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. That was an anomaly in history. Mm. And uh, by the way, that's, that's sort of where my sense of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it's interesting, man. It's, I, I like, um, I mean, it's always interesting to see how things are, how things are interconnected, you know, both you know, globally, historically, anything it's like if you're going to look at the world in 2020 then you might need to go back some decades or centuries ago to really understand like okay why what is it that brought us here like what was and it, it's strange how some of these things are connected you know how can someone who someone who doesn't really think deeply might think like oh wait like why is he talking about world war ii what does world war ii have to do with what's going on now but like when you can draw these links and connections and sort of see where things stem from and bubble up from and the re- responses and reactions in different countries, it really helps you to understand the world a lot better. Or if you're just looking at another nation and you're thinking, okay, why is, um, I don't know, why is China the way it is? Why is Saudi Arabia the way it is? Why are, why is, you know, even the languages they speak in different countries, right? Mm-hmm. You know, like, why do they speak English in Nigeria? Right? It's because, you know, for, oh, you know, look at the history right? Oh, why do they speak Portuguese in that country? Oh, they speak Spanish in that one. They speak French in that. And it's like, it's all just interesting how this stuff happens. And then another thing I think is super interesting is um, just the, the impact of technology, right? Mm-hmm. I think if you're, if you're talking, mm-hmm. I, was, I was speaking about this with my girlfriend the other day. If you're talking about, um, you know, modern relationships and the situation of certain things, it's like, actually, you have to, you have to also consider the role, of, the role of technology and how technology has just changed has just changed the game in, in so yeah. many, in so many ways, not just in relationships, but just, just everything. I mean, look at what we're doing right now, right? Mm-hmm. This is technology. Mm-hmm. We, we came across each other on Twitter and started following each other and chatting on there. And now we're recording this podcast, yeah, which, yeah. you know, thousands of people are then going to download and listen to. And it's like, whoa, that, 
that's new. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like all, all of this is new. People can now just, you know, you can, the connections and everything like this. You went from these little small communities and things where even just to go to another city a hundred mm-hmm. years ago, like that was a, that was a mission, right? Yeah. It's a huge mission. We're going to go from, you know, uh, we're going to go from New York to Idaho, you know, like that's a, <laughs> that, that, that's a mission, right? You need to prepare for this for like, you know, several weeks and it's this long journey and whatever. And, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just think it's, it's amazing how rapidly things have changed. And I don't think the average person has, I don't think the average person really takes time to sort of think like, whoa, like what, what's going on here? You know, what, what are yeah, we doing with? All of these social movements are, are downstream of the social conditions, which are, of course, impacted by technology. I mean, mm-hmm. you can like the I even the concept of feminism was ludicrous prior to the Industrial Revolution yes. because most people were agricultural. And I mean, they spent time together as a family. I mean, there was a division of labor, but it was all for the same purpose and it was also good because boys would spend a lot of time with their fathers when you had industrialization fathers would work in factories for 16 hours a day 12 16 Mm. hours boys were separated they were thrown in public schools that were not that were outside of the community so i mean i think it's one of the reasons why you see like a lot more masculine a lot of the guys who are like more more masculine rural areas Again, very healthy, healthy sort of masculinity comes from more of like a rural area because Mm -hmm. they have the family together and they're able to to spend time together. Um, Whereas the suburbs, I think, are probably the worst, the worst situation for it. So um, we'll see how that shifts over time. I think that we're in for a lot of technological changes. Yeah. What What do you foresee in that regard? Well, man, I mean... I think that this next decade, things are going to accelerate really, really quickly, especially because, you know, we talked about this a little bit before we started recording, but all the stuff with, with coronavirus, um, I think that there's more things that are going on behind the scenes and that, I mean, without getting too, too conspiratorial here, and this is not, by the way, for anybody who's listening, it's not to dismiss anything with Corona, which is real and it's dangerous and you guys People should take high dose vitamin C and chaga mushrooms. <laughs> you know, this is proven to kill it off within 24 to 48 hours. But um, I, I do think that there's going to be some big societal shifts that come after this. I think our economic system is going to be shifting after this. I think mm-hmm. a lot of what we've perceived in our, our political apparatus is going to change. I think culture is going to change as well. So okay. what, what are some big ones that you think? Well, um, with in which one economics or in any category what are two or three sort of big shifts that you potentially think okay this could actually happen well i think that central banking is gone okay that's that's done i mean trump just this weekend took control of the fed this Mm. is a this is very like it's not advertised publicly but by declaring uh i think it was like some defense production act he basically took control of the Federal Reserve and it's effectively merged with the Treasury now. Okay. And I think it's going to be a controlled demolition over the next couple of months to a year. Okay. It's going to go back. So fiat currency is over. I mean, so helicopter money is not going to be something that we have in the future. Well, um, you, so you, you think it'll go back to, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not an economic expert in this regard, but you think it'll go back to some kind of gold standard or how... I, I've, I've heard some, I'm not an economic expert either, yeah, yeah. but I've, I've heard like a gold silver base, but also on the blockchain oh, as wow. well. Okay. So I, I don't, and I don't know how that actually gets worked out mm. in practice, but, uh, but yeah, that's the, that's the direction I see things going. And I mean, technologically, I just, I think there's a lot of technology that has not been revealed at this point. And so I think that's okay. going to come out as a disclosure as well. And I can only speculate with that. But go on, go on, hit us with one. What What do you think? What do you think could be under wraps? All right, all right. Let's I, let's, is, let's get crazy. We're getting we're, get, we're getting crazy here. Let's go. So <laughs> I'll put on my my Alec Jones. Uh, yeah. No, honestly, <laughs> I had a podcast with this recently <laughs> with uh, with Craig James. I mean, it, we 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 went all into that stuff. Okay, okay, all into that stuff. Yeah, let's, um, let's scrape it. A lot of the technology is going to require us to raise our consciousness and raise our vibration. So by that, I mean, 
right now we have this mindset that's very much like victim, savior, perpetrator. And mm -hmm. this is like, a, it's like kind of like the karmic dynamic, the third dimensional karmic dynamic. And if we're going to raise to a higher vibration, it's just sort of like, it, it's, it's not being so quick to, to judge and to attack other people, sort of understanding objectively the role that, that people play, play with each other and mm -hmm. having a lot of love and, and uh, love and humor versus like anger and fear. Fear is like the, the big one here. Mm -hmm. um, most of the population is not in the position for that yet. I do think it's going to start to shift gradually. So a lot of this technology, I mean, if, if some of the things that I've read is true, and I mean, there's already been contact with, with extraterrestrials, basically. And that that's Ooh. all involved in the stuff that's going on here. And so that allows, I've heard of like replicator technology. Um, I, I don't know, man. I mean, I don't know, okay. but I, it, it is, some of the stuff is really far out and I don't know how fast it's going to come, but I know that like, for instance, um, we'll ha we're going to have internet directed from satellites on space. I mean, SpaceX has basically been space force. Mm -hmm. Most of Space Force has been outsourced to SpaceX for okay. years, and that's now. I mean, they're they're actually now just revealing this. They revealed it last week. Yeah. Um, okay. So, I, I think that our our future's in the stars, man. I think it's in the stars. When when you say our future, do you do you think do you think in and our we'll life? We'll see. This is either going to sound nuts. <laughs> that's cool, man. I like I like stuff. That's no, no. Nuts. I I think I think legitimately within a decade. Oh, within a decade, you think? Yeah, I mean, we're not leaving Earth. I'm not talking about that stuff. That's okay. Crazy. But, but when you but when you say the, the so what do you mean what do you mean specifically when you say that? I mean that our focus was going to start to to be towards the sort of galactic community. And look, man, I'm going to look nuts on this podcast, or I'm going to mm -hmm. look really prescient. Yeah. But I think that there's a lot of disclosure that's going to happen this year, okay. and a, a lot of the things that we're seeing right now is just it's just the beginning of it. Okay. Just the beginning of it. I'm 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 curious. I don't think we've uh, started to scratch the surface of what, what what we're even doing down here first yet, but we'll uh, yeah we'll see, man. Um, I I like to you know I don't I don't really care if ideas and theories sound like inverted commas crazy to people or whatever. I just like to you know and and look, there's so much stuff that <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that that we're dealing with right now and that we have right now that if you went 20 years ago and you, you told people, they'd be like, oh, dude, come on, that sounds, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sounds crazy. You know, even just look, look, just look at smartphones, right? Imagine like, ex go back, imagine going to like 1950, let alone 1900 and explaining like the smartphones and social media to people, let, the internet, right? How would you mm -hmm. even, how do you even explain it? You'd be like, yeah, like everyone's got this like little device and it's, you know, it's computer and they'll be like, what's a computer? Okay. Well, it's a, uh, we've got this thing and everyone has one and you know, we can communicate by voice and video and text and we can look up all the information that's anywhere in the world, like instantaneously. And we can, we can all communicate in real time and you can, they just be like looking at you like, what, what mm -hmm. are you even, you know, they put this guy in the asylum. Like, we'll see what, <laughs> what he's talking about. I think that the big thing for people to remember is that the, the universe is quantum in nature, which means that there's, there's all sorts of different possibilities for, for where things go, mm -hmm. right? What you can manifest, you know, you've heard of like the law of attraction. It's because you have the ability through your focus to direct outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of how people have been controlled is actually by convincing them to believe things that are bad for them. Which mm -hmm. is one of the reasons why negativity is such a bad thing because it actually starts to manifest mm -hmm. those outcomes. And yeah. so if you take this to a different level, like I think a lot of what's going on right now is actually it's like timeline fighting. It's that there's like people who believe, because you, you, you've known this you know, from being in the political space that sometimes it feels like people are living in two different worlds. Oh, totally, totally. It's, it's two different timelines. Mm. And those two timelines are sort of fighting for dominance, which is why one day it seems like, like even with coronavirus, mm. sometimes you're reading stuff and it's like, this is going to be like shutting down everything. Everyone's going to, you know, people are going to die. We can yeah. expect this to go on for, and then another people are, it's like, no, it's actually not that big of a deal. Like people are yet yeah, hurt. Some people are dying, but like, it's mostly under control yeah. and you can just feel it's like, it's almost like two different realities are, are fighting for each other. And I believe that 
I mean, that is actually what is happening in that the reality that you, you manifest, that's where, that's where things go. Gotcha. No, that's really, that's a really interesting thought. That's something to, I haven't heard it sort of framed that way. So I will, uh, I will mull on that for a while. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking at the, I'm just looking at the time, Pat. We're going to need to uh, to be wrapping this up fairly soon. But I wanted to uh, see: is there anything that you've got out or got coming, sort of this year, or that you've got out right now that you want people to be aware of and potentially to check out? Yeah, well, I think that I mean most of the work I do with clients is coaching, mm-hmm. but I have a master class out, and this is I think it's a it's a good opportunity for people who want to really understand my work. It's over 14 hours. And, okay. uh, and it's also, it's a, it's, it's basically, I, I made it for clients who are doing just like basic coaching with me. So it's not as much one-on-one time that mm-hmm. they have. I cover the vast majority of the topics that I cover with clients. Like I go and tackle it video after video and it runs the gauntlet from really deep psychological work to female nature, to dating game, relationship work, intimacy, sex. So it's really, I mean, and because of the deep nature of it, it doesn't even, even if you're in a relationship, you're going to get value out of like 90% of it. Even the sections on dating, there's stuff that's going to be directly applicable for your relationship. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's a Pat Stedman masterclass. So I recommend that. And if people just want to see what I'm all about and how I think, I mean, we talk about some crazy things here, um, but this is this email list, which I send out emails almost every day. Mm-hmm. It's all on dating relationships. And uh, that's www.patstedman.com slash opt-in. Okay. So awesome. Put a link in there. And uh, people can follow you on social media as well? Yep. Pat underscore Stedman. Awesome. Pat Stedman, thank you very much for coming on the podcast, man. Thank you, Zuby. Appreciate it.